What's up guys, how are you doing? Hope you're having a great week and uh, gonna have a fantastic weekend ahead. Today, I wanna have a little bit of fun and just, I guess, a little bit of venting as well, but I want to talk about the five dumbest pieces of advice I've ever heard uh, with regards to succeeding in sync licensing. Uh, some of these I've heard all throughout my 12 years in this industry, but a lot of them I've heard actually since launching my primarily YouTube channel, Sync My Music, and starting to become sort of a presence online in terms of being an educator for this business. I come across many other educators and many other points of advice, um, many other blogs, videos, channels, podcasts, you name it, um, because I have a lot of you guys that email me, and sometimes you guys will let me know that you're, you know, listening to many different sources, which I think is great. I'm not the end-all be-all of anything, of course. You should get your, your information from as many sources as you like. Um, but some of the advice and some of the information that I've been hearing over the last four years with my YouTube channel um, are just, it makes me want to smack my face with my hand. I mean, it is so, so ridiculous and really misleading. Um, some of the information and the advice that's getting put out there. And when I hear these bits of information and these bits of advice that my students are sort of double checking with me on. That's why they're reaching out to me to say, Jesse, do you agree with this? This is what this person's saying. This sounds a little bit weird to me, but maybe they're right. What do you think? So they're looking for essentially a second opinion. And I always usually give it and I'll tell them like, yeah, that's either they're, they're right on. I agree with that. But some of the times, and today that's what you're getting with the podcast is the t five top times, <laughs> the top instances when I just smacked myself in the face and said, I cannot believe this is what people are telling other people to do, or at least this is information that's actually being shared out there in terms of somebody claiming to know anything about this business and thinking they're leading you towards anything other than absolute just failure, <laughs> just absolute, uh, you know, clutching yourself on the side of the road because you completely got run over by this business and you had no idea that you were going the wrong direction, but now you are basically roadkill, okay? That's how bad some of this stuff is. So. This will be a little bit of fun, uh, kind of a, a venting one for me, so let's get started. So number five, and this one, I don't understand why I've heard this, but I've heard this from at least three of my students, and they've all said the exact same thing. They'll say, Jesse, I've heard it takes three years for your royalties to actually get to your bank account. Now, this is so interesting because I know that there's, I don't know where this is coming from, and I don't know who is teaching this, but I know this is a very specific piece of advice because it's probably more than just a coincidence that three different students have given me this exact same number, three years, right? It's not like one person said five, another person said two, and some other person said four. They all said, well, I've heard it takes three years to get to royalties, so I don't know if I want to do this. Now, if you're not aware, it does take time for your royalties to come to you, all right? And that time period is nine to 12 months, okay? So we're talking about one year or sometimes less than one year. So it's basically one year from the date that you get a track placed on a TV show or any sort of a medium where you can earn performance royalties, okay? That is not three years, that is one year from the date you get a placement. Now, obviously, if you're just getting started, let's say today was your first day in sync licensing and you're just gonna start creating your album, well, it might take you two months to get your album together. Okay, so we gotta push that forward two months. Now, you're gonna go pitch to some libraries. Let's say, let's assume your tracks are high quality and you've done your research on who you're gonna submit your music to and the library you pitch to is uh, reputable, it's well vetted, and you've submitted some great tracks that really suit their needs well, and you've really um, pitched to them in a very smart way. Let's say it takes you about two weeks to get accepted by them, about the time it takes for them to ingest your tracks, get you the contract, you sign it over, you agree to it, and you're off and running. So that's another two weeks on top of the two months. Now at that point, how long does it take before you get that first TV placement? So you're in the library, your tracks are distributed by them, all of their clients have access to them. How long does that take? Big question mark, right? That could be the next day, that could literally be a year from then, that could be five years from then. You don't really know, okay? So that's one of these parts of the industry that we have no control over. So the only way that that three-year timeline makes sense is if you get accepted by a library within, let's say, three months, let's just make it easy and you get your tracks out there and then nobody 
touches your tracks for let's say, I guess a year and a half, a little over a year and a half. And then at that point, some client comes in and goes, hey, I need those tracks because I have this reality show, let's put them in here. Then from that date, which is now I guess two years past when you got started in sync licensing, you have to wait that final year to get the royalties. So that's where three years would actually come in play. But you don't have to automatically assume you're gonna have to be waiting around three years for royalties to come in. So I don't know where that's coming from, but it's certainly not true. There is a lot of unknowns in this industry and I definitely have had tracks that I got placed, or sorry, I got accepted by a library in 2009 that finally got a placement in 2016, <laughs> okay? But the reason why that didn't uh, bum me out or destroy me or completely just demotivate me is because that wasn't the only song that I'd ever released with a sync library, right? I've been doing this month after month, year after year, and I have over a thousand tracks now distributed through multiple libraries that I've partnered with throughout the years. So not all tracks are gonna get all the placements right away. Of course, this is a numbers game. At the end of the day, like it or not, this is a bit of a numbers game where if you only put out 10 tracks a year and you expect those 10 tracks to carry you to full-time income, you are dreaming. That is not going to happen, likely. I can't say infinitely can't happen or it's impossible. Very, very unlikely. If you wanna put the odds in your favor, do what smart producers do and get into a system of constantly creating, constantly releasing, constantly building up your catalog in the system to allow for more opportunities for your tracks to get placed, okay? It can take three years, it can take five years, it can take 10 years before some producers get any royalties, but that's not likely because the industry is structured that way, that's because they've been not doing it the right way. That's because they've been going slow, not producing consistently, or maybe they are partnering with the wrong library. They're just putting your music in a library that has really no clients that need their music, but they just thought, well, as long as I'm in a library, I'm gonna do well. It's, it's much more than that. You really gotta do your research and know who you're partnering with. So let's move on. Number four, next on the list. Um, this one, um, I do know where this one came from, but I'm not gonna put them on blast, but I do know who has been saying this and I just disagree because it just, on the f maybe, not, maybe you don't understand it when I first say it, but once I explain it, I think you're gonna understand why this is just completely foolish. So the next bit of advice I was shared was that you don't have to mix or really master, more master, you don't really have to master your sync tracks that you send to a library. Because the argument goes, well, at the end of the day, either they're gonna master it themselves or the client, when they put your track behind a commercial or a TV show, they're just gonna duck it down, they're just gonna play with it, they'll mess with it, they'll put their, you know, whatever uh, uh, plugins or options they need to, they're gonna put sound effects in there. So for you to go through all this extra effort to have your tracks fully mastered and completed doesn't make any sense because they're gonna do it for you anyways. It kind of makes sense when you just hear that. When that's the only explanation you hear, you kind of go, well, I guess it does make sense because yeah, they are gonna sort of mess with the levels and if my track needs to be quieter or louder, like they're gonna do that themselves. They do do that. Here's why that is completely foolish and why it will always shoot yourself in the foot and completely ruin your chances of doing this full time. That's such a huge assumption to just think that other people will do your homework for you, okay? So if you come to a library and say, here's my tracks, I haven't mastered them, but don't worry about it. I've heard that you guys do all the mastering, so here you go, enjoy, right? How does that look compared to the next producer next to you who put together the album and mastered it and said, I've mastered all of these tracks. They are industry quality, industry standard. I've compared them to the tracks that are in your catalog and they stand up back to back with them and they are competitive. Which one of those two producers sounds more professional, sounds more appealing, sounds more like somebody that you would wanna work with if you were a library? Obviously you wanna work with the one who did their homework, even if later on they decide we're going to duck this track down, it's too loud, we're gonna mix, we're gonna mess with this, we're gonna throw a plug-in on, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Or even maybe later on they say, you know what, we want a version of your track without your mastering plugins because we really wanna master ourselves and do something else. That's fine, you can always supply an unmastered version. You just deselect de a couple of your mastering plugins and bounce it down and they can have that, okay? but you should never, never give your, assume that somebody else will do your homework for you. If you're gonna be a sync licensing producer in 2020 and moving forward, you better be a one man or woman shop, okay? You create the tracks or maybe you co-collaborate, but if you're writing it yourself, you create the tracks, you mix the tracks and you master the tracks all by yourself. And you absolutely can do those things. I know for some of you that sounds
sounds crazy. That sounds way too intimidating. That sounds like maybe you couldn't actually get across to um, learn those skills because you've heard, well, you have to be a professional master and you have to be uh, in a professional mixing environment. And BS, guys, 12 years speaking to you right now, I've never professionally acu acoustically treated any room that I've worked in. In fact, the first six to eight years of my licensing career, I was producing in my bedroom and the sound treatment I had was my bed that was basically absorbing the sound waves. That's it. And I was mastering and completing all of my tracks and created full-time income with my music. So if I can do that, and I wasn't professionally trained how to be a mastering engineer or anything like that, I learned it all myself, trial and error. If I can do that, and now with the resources that you have, if you're in Sync Academy with all the tutorials where we teach you literally how to master out of your bedroom essentially, you can do that. You have literally no reason why you can't do that as well. Okay, so I just want to encourage you guys do not fall for that one. That is something you really should be doing is you should be mastering your tracks. You should be taking that upon yourself to make sure that you are uh, being as prepared as possible, because if you don't assume um, or if you assume that other people will master your tracks and you go to all these libraries with that assumption, you can already tell how many doors will be slammed in your face or just not ever never opened because you're basically coming to them with a half finished project that they expect these days producers and musicians to do it themselves, okay? So bad advice, master and mix, of course, all of your tracks. Moving on, this one's so common and I've heard this well before and I have thought about this well before I started Sync My Music and everything I'm doing now and it's something that I'm really glad I didn't do early on in my career, but a lot of producers fall for this and it's pretty common, you guys have all heard this one, well, you know what, why don't you just send your music to multiple libraries and see what sticks, right? Like, if you're sending it to one library, man, like you're really decreasing your odds of success. You should just send your music to 50 different libraries and that way you'll definitely get at least one of them that'll come back to you. I, I hear this from so many producers and they think this is the way to go about it. I call this the spam approach and basically there are two ways to build a business online. If you think about it, like if you want to, let's say, build um, you know, a reputable company where you're trying to... Um, uh, create like a customer base so you can actually sell your product. Well, one is you can spam just a lot of random people. You can pay for a list and you just put all their email addresses in the system and spam them all out with just garbage. And you know where spam, you know, email goes. It goes into the spam folder now. And even if it doesn't get there, most people recognize spam for what it is and they're not being respected by it. They're not really interested in it. And it's nothing, has nothing to do with them. So they're just like, well, this is just not about me. So delete, thank you, bye. The other way you could actually you know, be useful and sell your product and be successful is you can go find people that need your product and provide value to them in one form or another. You know, It could be videos, it could be a newsletter, um, it could be free samples of your product, it could be just a demonstration of how your product or service works, whatever it is, and you're just going out and being useful for people and then you go, by the way, you also have this product, right? And so if you'd like to um, you know, buy this product from me and actually become more successful in whatever way it is or make your life better, here it is, right? So those are pretty much two of the very, very simplified um, you know, ways that you can go about succeeding. And I see producers following the same two paths. So the one path is 50 different companies. Just put them all in there. Let's see what happens. That's spamming, okay? Usually, you're not going to get anywhere anywhere with that. And even if you do, what's, let's say you get three companies that come back to you out of the 50 and they all want to exclusively take your tracks. Well, now you think, great, I'm in the power position. I get to choose which ones I want to partner with. Yes, you do. And guess what else you get to choose? Which two companies you get to piss off on day one of your industry, of your career, of your, of your journey here in this business. There aren't that many companies that you can go piss off a lot of them and think that you're going to have a long-term career. So I, I recommend that you be a person of honor and, and, um, and I guess a little bit of ethic, ethics and, and just make sure that you're, if you're pitching to one library, you're giving them first dibs at it first to say, I want you guys to be the one that I work with. And if they pass, they don't get back to you within a week or two, you can then move on to somebody else. But being sort of honorable with your product, it just shows, it says a lot about your character, it says a lot about your seriousness, and also shows, of course, how much you've personally researched this company. You're not gonna be waiting for a week or two for just some random company. This is somebody that you really care about and you wanna give them first dibs on. So it makes you look a lot better, it increases your chance of actually producing and, and creating meaningful personal relationships. That's what it's about. Spamming a whole bunch of companies, is that meaningful? Is that personable? No, you're not gonna be doing anything very significant in this business by spamming your way through it. This is a people business. You gotta have relationships. And think about yourself. Who do you like to get emails from? Spammers or people who care about you? People that really have done their research, they know about you, they have some sort of a vetted interest in you, and they wanna come and supply you with something useful for your life. That's who you wanna hear from, and that's who a library wants to hear from. 
Moving on, number two. This one's going to get me in a lot of trouble from some of you guys, and that's okay. I still don't understand why people are still doing this and giving out this advice. But the advice I hear from many people, and this is from a lot of people that teach this, is yes, you can send your music to music supervisors and it can work. <laughs> this one I still don't understand. I still do not see why this makes any sense for anybody, especially now in 2020 and moving forward. Maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it might have made a little bit more sense, but since the internet became sort of the way that everybody does business now, and since there's just way more producers actually going after music supervisors, this is some of the dumbest advice I've ever heard, ever. Because just think about what you're putting yourself up against. Yes, I know the dream is there. I know that the desire is there to go, if I could only reach out and connect with this music supervisor who's in charge of this really important TV show, then I could get the placement. I understand that. Like that's the same mentality that I had thinking if only I could get that record deal and they could put me on tour, then I could go do this and then I could do that. But I just got to get into this one door with this one person and then I could really take off and do well. I totally get it. I call that the lotto strategy, the lotto mindset where you are not putting a system in place to catch as much success as you can. You're basically just putting one fishing pole into a gigantic lake and hoping something grabs onto your fishing pole, okay? Rather than casting a huge net over a large area and catching a whole bunch of different kinds of fish, you're just basically putting one little bloop popped in there while there are also hundreds, maybe even thousands of other fishers, fishermen, also plopping their um, fishing pole into the lake trying to all get that one single fish. Does that sound like a great fishing expedition to you, right? That there's thousands of you and there's one fish. Does that sound like a place where you're going to be able to feed your family and actually get that fish? It's possible, right? We can't rule it out. You could be the one that actually gets that single fish and gets that actual music supervisor to respond to you and say, we love your music. Yes, we're going to place it. Here's your $100,000. Here's all your glory. Here's all your exposure. Yes, it's definitely possible. Is it likely? Is it in your favor? Are the numbers in your favor to do that? No, you should know that, that there are hundreds if not thousands of other people that are doing the exact same thing, bombarding music supervisors who have no time to sort through a bunch of unsolicited tracks. They don't have the resources to do that. They're not set up to do that. And that's not what they're interested in doing, okay? So, so many producers and musicians and bands are still on this treadmill because the other thing is too, let's say you are the one fisherman who gets the fish. You get the big prize, you get the placement, you get the exposure. Is that a repeatable process? Do you think that same music supervisor is gonna come back to you every single week or maybe every single month for every project that they have coming through their, their desk? No, you know why? It's not because you're not a great musician. It's not because um, you know your music wouldn't be really awesome. Their projects are not gonna always need your particular style, right? So let's say you're hip hop, but they start working on a country uh, TV show, like you know some reality show about people living kind of in the, in the sticks. Do they need a lot of hip hop music for that? Nope, it's over. Well, okay, I guess I'll go fishing again. Let's find another music supervisor. Let's go to compete with another thousand people to try to catch that other fish. So even if you get lucky, you're just going to come continuously run up against having to go back to the same beginning state, which is, all right, let's go back down with our odds and let's just start up from, this, from scratch and let's go get that lotto ticket and let's hope that we win this time again. That's a wishing and hoping strategy and it is worthless. It is not going to get you where you want to get to in this business. I don't know of any producers that do it that way who create full-time income, who are only submitting to music uh, supervisors. What they're doing is once in a while, maybe getting lucky and getting a nice hit, and that's awesome, but then they also do other things in terms of their selling their music to the public and that kind of thing. But what I see is producers that are partnering with libraries or maybe creating libraries of their own, but they get into a system where they're basically reaching out to a company or um, some sort of a, an affiliate, a syndicate essentially, where you are getting access to multiple music supervisors. And guess what? That's what a music library is. It is a sort of a huge uh, hub that multiple music supervisors go to. Why? Because there's so much music to select from, they can just find whatever they need through an online search very quickly. And most importantly, everything is pre-cleared, right? So that's the one thing that you don't get to offer when you directly pitch to a music supervisor because you could tell them, hey, these are all cleared. You can have these tracks, no problem. Do they really trust you? Do they really know you? Do they know that you didn't sample this from somebody else? And you know, how do they really know what they're really getting? They don't. But most music supervisors these days are going to libraries or catalogs that already have everything pre-cleared that they already have a good reputation with so they can sleep soundly at night knowing 
I placed this track from this library with this client. Now I know that there's not gonna be any legal problems. No artists are gonna come after and try to sue us to say that we didn't authorize it because everything in a library mostly is always cleared for use no matter what. So everybody can kind of sleep easy. Everybody can get their music as soon as possible. So that's what I do with my careers. I put my music in places where multiple music supervisors, ad agencies, reality TV show producers, trailer creators, everybody who creates content can come and get a piece of what I'm offering. So I have I have a net out there and I actually have multiple nets because I have my music in multiple uh, exclusive libraries. Over the years, I've partnered with many different ones. So I'm casting nets all throughout the industry all the time. I'm not foolish enough to throw one fishing pole out there and hope that I'm gonna catch a fish. You can try that, good luck. I wish, I hope it works out for you and you get at least one big catch out of that kind of thing. But if that's still your plan, I am going to strongly encourage you to rethink that. I just don't think that makes any sense. I just don't think the numbers are on your side with that kind of approach. All right, here we go. Number one, the first, the, the, the primary, the biggest piece of dumb advice <laughs> that I've ever heard is never to sign over your publishing to a library. So this is the one that I keep getting run up against and I know that not necessarily people that teach sync licensing talk about this, but there's just a lot of people who talk about music industry success who are always still like a broken record, never sign over your publishing, never sign over your publishing, never sign over your publishing. And it makes sense for a certain part of the industry and it makes sense for certain artists, but it is not as easy as that where it's like a black or white you know, everybody should just either follow us or don't follow this. I don't ever believe usually that works for everybody. So if you're not aware that when you partner with a music library in this business, you are going to have to give up your publishing for the most part, 100% of it, okay? If you're not aware of it, sorry to break that news to you, but that is the reality of working with this business. That doesn't mean that you're giving up 100% of your any income or your money or your royalties. That pretty much means you're giving up 50%, half, of the income that's gonna get generated from your music. Now, the reason why I believe that's cool with me, I'm fair with that, I'm very happy to do that, is because without these library partners, what chance do I have personally to go out and make all these connections and get my music placed in TV shows? I know I could do it, do I really wanna spend the effort and the time and the energy to do that? Not after the interviews I've had with music library owners, and I, I really can feel how much work that takes to wine and dine and open up doors and open up relationships. No thanks, I just like to make music. So the way that I see it is, it's a 50-50 partnership. Without me, the library doesn't have music, but without the library, I don't have opportunities. So we kind of need each other to make this whole thing work. Again, they are my teammates, I'm on their team. And the other thing is that when I give up my publishing, I'm giving them an incentive to get greedy with my music, right? Because now they're earning some back-end income from the tracks that they place that are mine. So now I don't have to pay them um, any salary, any fees, any anything. And I have now, because I have libraries around the world that are representing my music, I have people I've never met, will never know their name, on my, essentially, payroll. They're on my staff. They're all out there pitching my music. I mean, they're pitching everybody's music in the catalog, but my music is included. And you know how much comfort that gives me when I'm laying in bed at night knowing that, like, you know what, probably right now, somebody somewhere is maybe considering using my music and there's somebody I've never met going like, yeah, you should, this is a great track. And they don't know who I am, but they'll they will stand to gain, gain something from getting my track placed. So the way that I see it is that I like people being incentivized that are uh, on my team. So that way I don't have to keep cracking the whip. I don't have to say, hey guys, come on, keep, keep shopping my music, get it out there. Why would you have to do that if they're already gonna be incentivized by becoming, you know, they're gonna make money off of my music when it gets placed. And as long as it's fair, as long as I feel it's fair for the deals that I've signed, why not? It's a great thing. I mean, if you've ever had, I certainly haven't, but if you've ever had employees, I know that obviously one of the ways that you can really incentivize employees is by giving them sort of an ownership share, a small, even if it's very small, but just some sort of an ownership share in the company so that they feel like, man, the better this company does, the better my stock performs and the better, you know, the more money I'm going to have or my retirement account's going to grow or whatever it is, right? And so that gets people to not just think about, well, all right, I'll put in my eight hours and then I'm going home and I don't care about the company. People now are thinking more about how they can do, go above and beyond to make the company more successful because that means that makes them more successful and more wealthy, right? So once I started changing my mindset and not thinking about this in terms of like, oh, I wanna keep 100% of everything and anybody wants to take my publishing, they're just ripping me off. As soon as I got past that kind of like just ridiculous mindset, like the whole world started opening up to me and this business is really built on those kind of partnerships and relationships. So if you don't think you're gonna to have to be forced to, or not forced to, but if you're not gonna be asked to give up your publishing when you sign with a library, 
you're going to be in for a big surprise because it is going to come. So I hope that that's not something that completely scares you away. Now, the only producer or artist that I would say it probably doesn't make sense to do that is if you've already got some sort of a plan for your publishing, right? So you already want to do a tour. You already want to sign with a publishing company. You already want to do whatever with your music and you plan on having something to do with your publishing down the road. Okay, that would be an unwise thing then to give your publishing up to a music library that you're not really sure it's what you wanna do for the rest of your life or it's not really sure you wanna give up for a certain period of time, okay? So if you've got other plans or you've, especially if you're making money with your publishing right now, like you actually have some sort of income coming in due to your publishing that you own, then yes, you should really second guess about giving any of that away, of course, right? But I can almost guarantee most of you guys listening to this right now are not making any money at all with your publishing, okay? Sorry, that might sound really cruel, might sound a little bit mean, but let's just be honest, we're big boys and girls here. You are not making money with your publishing right now, right? Your music, most of the most of you guys, your tracks have been sitting on your hard drive or if not sitting in some, you know, some of your social media accounts and getting plays and if you do have ads enabled in your YouTube channel, you're getting pennies, you're getting basically nothing, right? There's not much going on. So you're holding on to this thing thinking that it's like so important to hold on to when it's not doing anything for you. You're not earning anything, there's nothing growing. Now if you have a plan, that's different, but a lot of guys and and people that get into this business, they don't really have a plan for what they're gonna do with their publishing. And then when a music library comes along and goes, yeah, we could actually do something with them, but we're gonna need the publishing. We could actually make you some money with your tracks. People then wanna take their ball and run home. It's like, that was the one opportunity where you could actually do something with your publishing. Cause that's what you, it's not that you're just giving it away and you're not getting anything in return. Think about what you're getting in return. You're getting people to be your advocate, to pitch your music, to start putting money in your pocket in exchange for your publishing. Publishing is pretty much imaginary, right? It's sort of a concept. It doesn't exist in the real world. We just kind of made it up. But you're giving away this imaginary thing, which is, publishing in exchange for real effort. Like there's actually real human beings that are gonna make phone calls on your behalf to try to get your tracks placed. I can't I can't ex- ex- uh, stress that enough to you, what a great deal that is. At least for me, I, I'm just gonna speak for myself. I take that deal all day long because I will give up away something imaginary for something that's real and tangible can actually get me benefits and put money in my account. And that's what I've done, okay? So, so many producers don't think about it that way. They think they're just selling out or they're just giving away something. You know, I always go back to the usual analogy of like, do you want 100% of a grape or do you want 50% of a watermelon? So just imagine those two things in your mind when you get presented with that. So when the library says, hey, we need, we need your publishing, that means we're gonna do a 50-50 split with you. Imagine that. You can say, no, you know what? I want 100%. So you might be taking that grape that's not producing anything for you. It's small, it's not gonna be nourishing, um, and it's not gonna certainly sustain you for years and years and years. Or you can take half of a watermelon, which is a lot, <laughs> right? So just keep that in mind that it's not always about the percentage and what who owns what, but it's about exactly what you're giving up and what you're taking away from these kind of um, uh, offers when they come to you, okay? So with that being said, that is this uh, week's episode. I went a little longer actually than I've been able to. This is really cool. So this one was really fun. I enjoyed it. I think these ranting ones, I just really get into a little bit more because I don't know, sometimes it just feels good to sort of get this off my chest and it just always bothers me when I hear just really ridiculous stuff. And some of this stuff I know comes from people that even are in the sync licensing industry and that bothers me even more. But I know a lot of it also comes from people that have never really stepped foot inside of this industry and they've read a book or maybe even watched one of my videos or something, I don't know. And they're giving out this information. It's like, dude, like, come on. Like, it's just ridiculous. So all I can do though is I can't stop anybody from doing what they're doing, but all I can do is try to set the record straight as best I possibly can. And just be honest with you guys about what really works, what I've really seen in this business. That's really all I've been able to do uh, since I started my YouTube channel and this podcast is just keep it real with you guys. Let you guys know really what it's like and what you're going to be up against. So I hope that this podcast episode was just one step further in making you sure that you could be a real successful player in this industry. Thank you for listening to the Sync My Music podcast. If you enjoyed the show and want me to do more episodes, all that I ask is that you leave me a review on whatever platform or app that you're listening to. It just takes a few seconds. I'll never charge for this podcast and I wanna keep it 100% ad free. And your review right now will help me do just that. Thank you so much.